We all had these toys when we grew up, the toys that we would never forget. And when I was a kid, I was extremely happy with my radio-controlled car, driving the car around through the entire neighborhood. And our next speaker probably would find that incredibly boring. He's not controlling cars or mini cars. Uh, I watched videos online, they're on YouTube, so you can all check it on YouTube as well. But he is actually controlling mice in his lab. Uh, and he can mind control the mice to tell them whether to go left or right. Our next speaker has, combines two backgrounds that you don't often see together, um, bioengineering and psychiatry. And he's living in the west coast of the United States. There's a nine-hour time difference. So it must be, I think, 6.30 in the morning uh, right now. Um, may have a warm welcome for the D.H. Chen uh, professor, professor of bioengineering and psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Stanford University, a brilliant professor, Carl Dyseroth. <laughs> welcome, welcome here. And, and you're sitting in your home, I think, right? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm here with my... Uh family, uh, and most importantly, my wife and also a colleague who's here and will join me in the, in the ceremony. Yeah, so, so we, we will see them uh, uh, later. And, and you're now at your home. Um, I have to say, it, something intrigues you. Um, when I get older, I get less and less hair, and you seem to be getting more and more every single day. How do you do it? What's your secret? I'm not sure. Uh, clean living, I guess. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll try. I'll try. Have you ever been to Rotterdam? I have. Uh, I've had a, a wonderful uh, several visits uh, to the Netherlands. I have some uh, friends and, and colleagues there who I uh, uh, would dearly love to see again. Uh, uh, and I look forward to, to hopefully not too far in the future coming to, to see you all. Yeah, because I heard that you might give some master classes here. And uh, I think the students will be thrilled to see you here in reality, because I've understood that you are one of the most brilliant scientists in the world, and we are very happy to have you here. And of course, I could say something nice about you, but uh, we found um, another brain scientist, um, a professor at the Erasmus MC, vice director of the Netherlands Institute for Neuroscience, uh, your honorary supervisor, Professor Chris de Zeeuw. Ladies and gentlemen, Carl, um, I'm so happy to introduce you to each other. Um, Carl is, is uh, what I think is the greatest neuroscientist of our century. Uh, and uh, so one picture did not suffice. I show you here three pictures of Carl. Um, they're all linked to three major awards in just the recent year. So on the left side, you see when he received the Breakthrough Prize, in the middle, when he last year got the Heineken Award, and this year on the right, the Lasker Prize. He has many, many uh, awards, and uh, I will try to very briefly uh, convince you that he really deserves all these awards by making major breakthroughs. I will highlight three points, two technical ones and one in terms of content. Now, if you think about the two technical ones, I want to highlight to you his discoveries in optogenetics and clarity. Um, so let me give you two examples of each. First, about optogenetics. If you have the brain, which can be any brain here in the audience, we have many different types of neurons, small ones, big ones, ones that excite others, others that inhibit others. And the problem is, if you take any drug, this drug will probably affect all neurons in all your brain. Yeah? If I stick in an electrode inside this brain, I will excite all of them. So we basically don't understand what we're doing. This problem was solved by Carl. He used special proteins, which he put into very specific cell types, and thereby the cells became sensitive to a certain wavelength of light. And he developed this technique, which we call optogenetics, in such a way that we can stimulate or inhibit every different type of neuron in the brain whenever we want and where we want. 
using different colors of wavelength. He will tell you more about this, I'm sure. Now, in practice, this has yielded, in almost every neuroscience lab in the world, major breakthroughs. I will just give you a few, one in another lab somewhere, another one in our lab. Here you see an example uh, where we actually can see that the, the circuitry that's responsible for addiction is uncovered. So when you look at this projection, what we call prefrontal cortex, to dopaminergic cells, yes, which are highlighted in green, that connection is a major contributor to controlling addiction. Yeah? This was uncovered with optogenetics in animals and is now being tried out in humans, as you can see on the right side, by stimulating at the right side the circuitry that was uncovered by optogenetics. It's just one example, there are many. This is one example from our own lab, actually a collaboration between the Department of Neuroscience, Neurosurgery, and uh, the Electronics Department at TU Delft. So it's part of the medical delta and the convergence. What you see here is a patient with epilepsy. Yeah? Epilepsy occurs in the big brain, yeah? and we uncovered, based upon theoretical grounds, that actually, if you want to control activity, epileptic activity in the cerebral cortex, you better stimulate the cerebellar nuclei just because of numerical differences, divergence, how the neurons project to each other. So we stimulate, and this was also uncovered with optogenetics. You can see it in blue. Whenever there's a spike on wave discharge, which is epileptic activity, you give the optogenetic stimulation and the seizure stops instantly. Yeah? Whenever there's a seizure, you can use it at the right time. Now, together with Delft, there was this closed-loop system developed that you can automatically generate the stimulation when the seizure occurs. Yeah. This is now ongoing in a trial together with the Department of Neurosurgery. Clarity. We have already, always, been uh, trying through very painstaking, hard-working anatomy, uncover the location of molecules and projections in the brain. Carl saw that this was an incredible amount of work, and he invented the clarity technology, using certain chemicals by which he could take out the molecules that blur, that blur the vision. So instead of making sections for, for years and years and uncovering structures, you can now, with this technology, you can see the location uh, of molecules, and you can find out projections. Yeah, these are actually the zones that were uncovered by Jan Vogt, my, my uh, predecessor. And it took him years to find this in, um, in very hard, painstaking sections. Yeah, now we can do it in just a few seconds with this technology. Um, the same thing, inspired by this technology, my students now are uncovering projections that have not been described before. Yeah, so here, for example, you see a direct projection between the cerebral cortex and the cerebellum, which also gives new impetus to new uh, investigations. Um, <clears throat> these are the two major technical breakthroughs that uh, Carl invented, he and his collaborators. But maybe the most important thing of all is that he's a psychiatrist. He's still seeing patients every week. He's still having this huge empathy, if you read his book, he understands the mind of an autistic person, of a person with a personality disorder with a severe depression. And he can translate those questions into what is the underlying mechanism in these patients. And he uses these technologies like optogenetics to uncover the principles. You can read it directly in his book where he directly relates from sentence to sentence these different approaches which are very fertile for each other. It's therefore that I think we should be very grateful that Carl is willing to accept the doc honorary doctorate. You really make minds matter. This is the motto of Erasmus University, Carl. And so uh, I think you are the perfect candidate. And I'm now going to speak the formal words being the honorary promoter. So by virtue of the powers invested in us by statutes and in accordance with the decision of the doctorate board, we hereby confer upon you, Karl Alexander Dyserov, the title of Dr. Honoris Causa, together with all the rights 
which statutes and custom attach to this degree. As a token and proof thereof, we present you with the corresponding charter duly signed and sealed and clothe you with the kappa. <laughs> the time flies, yes. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Professor Dezeu, Chris. Uh, I remember our time very well uh, visiting together. I hope to get back uh, to see you all in uh, Rotterdam or, or wherever the world lets us gather again uh, in the near future. And I'm tremendously honored to accept this uh, honorary degree uh, from Erasmus University and from all of you. I'm uh, uh, so excited for the future, but inspired by all the efforts of the present, how the global community has come together in this uh, difficult time. And uh, I am uh, above all uh, looking forward to the advances we can make in, in human health uh, together, building on science and building on understanding. Thank you. Now, I look forward to sharing uh, some of our work. Uh, and is, this is, uh, I have about a, a 10 minutes of, of, uh, of science if you're willing to hear it uh, from me. So can you see my uh, screen? Yes. OK, wonderful. Now, uh, the, what you see represented here on the screen, uh, to the left, you see some single-celled uh, algae. And to the right, you see a transparent uh, brain of a mouse. Now, the uh, beautiful thing about where we are today is that we can take proteins, genes, from single-celled organisms algae, and we can put them into brains and use them to understand motivation, energy, aggression, thirst, hunger, primal drives, their conflicts, and their resolutions, even things as complex as parenting. And I'll tell you about how this works. But first, uh, this is a, a painting some of you may be uh, familiar with. This, for me, captures the human disease of major depression very well. This uh, reflects not just the sadness, but to me also the isolation of depression, the inability to communicate what is going on inside. And the hope that we have for the future is that we will be able to turn this opaque and mysterious organ into something that we can read like a book and understand uh, as if we were turning the pages of a, 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 a textbook or a, a work of literature. And we can do that with tools that come from uh, microbes. And this underscores the value of basic science. And if we go back more than 150 years, this gentleman here, uh, a, a Russian botanist named Andrei Feminsen, was doing something so basic, so far from neuroscience or even psychiatry was studying single-celled green algae. And he noticed in 1866 that algae in a dish would move toward the light. Uh, if you had a saucer of, of algae uh, in water, that they would move toward the side where the light was. And if the light was brighter, they would back off and achieve an intermediate uh, positioning. And so this is plant behavior. And miraculously, this turns out to be the foundation for well, what we call optogenetics. Although that was some time ago, uh, more recently in the last 50 years, uh, a number of uh, my colleagues and I have uh, identified additional members of the proteins from this family of uh, organisms uh, that give rise to this light activated behavior. Ancient forms of bacteria called uh, archaebacteria. This is the single celled algae called Chlamydomonas. This is a group or colonial algae called Volvox. And we found out that all these microorganisms achieve light mediated control 
of their functions with small proteins, little biomolecules that live in the membranes of cells and the surface membranes of cells. And this lets us do something quite amazing. We can now control cells with light. Uh, we usually think about using light to collect information to observe. Here, that is uh, flipped around. We now use light to control things. And this achieves something that electrical or magnetic stimulations can't do. They can't separate what uh, one cell or another is going to do because all cells are electrical in the brain. But if we use genetic tricks to put these proteins from the microbes that respond to light and move charged particles, ions across the membrane, essentially creating electricity, then only the cells that we've put that gene into will respond to the light because none of the cells initially respond to light. And we call this optogenetics. This gives us the specificity we need uh, and that Professor Desayo described. Now these uh, proteins are a very complex and beautiful uh, uh, family of, of proteins. They, just like a, a family tree or the tree of life, they exist in a great diversity that stems from a common ancestor uh, long ago. And we've been identified just in the same way using what we call X-ray crystallography or cryo-EM. We've been able to crack the structures of these proteins and see how they work, see how they achieve this miraculous transformation of light into electricity with just a single gene, a single protein. And just, uh, just as the double helix of DNA, the same kind of uh, crystallography that was used to, 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 to crack that mystery. And we can see that they are, these are beautiful proteins and uh, we can get into the angstrom level of resolution. Uh, these gray spheres are water molecules that you can see in this image at the top and the bottom. And this structure in the middle of these green cylinders is a vitamin A-like molecule called retinal. And we can see the positions of all the atoms uh, along this structure. The blue arrows going from top to bottom are the pore uh, through which the uh, ions flow. And so the vitamin A-like molecule, retinal, receives the photon, creates a little kink in its structure. That opens the pore where the blue arrows are, and that lets charged particles run through. So that's how the transformation of a photon into electricity works, all within a single uh, protein. And we've been able to use this structure and models to create new kinds of transduction of photons into electricity. We can make very rapidly responsive proteins where we can play in 200 or 200 times per second blue light flashes and get electrical responses. We've made red light instead of blue light active, activated uh, uh, channel rhodopsins, these are called. We've also created channel rhodopsins that uh, are bistable, where we can flip them into and out of stable uh, excitatory uh, states. And we've even created different kinds of ions flowing through. The ones I've talked about so far let positive ions through. That turns out to stimulate neurons to fire. But we've also relined the whole pore of the channel and allowed negative ions through. And that lets us shut off neurons to turn them off. And so we, with uh, putting molecular uh, understanding uh, together uh, with, with, with uh, uh, modeling and with experiments, we can create totally new kinds of function that even uh, nature had not yet achieved. And this work has been going on now for uh, uh, about 17 years. Uh, the very first experiment uh, was back in 2004. Uh, and this is the notebook I had from that very first uh, moment. This is a, a single neuron in a dish uh, that has a channel rhodopsin coupled to a yellow fluorescent protein. So we can see it on the surface of the cell. This cell is just about 25 millionths of a meter wide. And with light exposure, what I found, this little red marker reveals that I was able to stimulate the neuron with light and activate it by putting in this gene from algae. So that was the first initial hint that this might work. But then the advances, including making this red light activated uh, tool, we were able to achieve the uh, following, which is controlling even single neurons in the brains of living animals. And if we play this movie here, what you can see is there are uh, uh, three traces at the top that are gray, and then uh, uh, several traces which are uh, rainbow colored at the bottom. And you can see all the rainbow ones are, are revealing activation in synchrony. They're being stimulated together with a beam of light. And the ones that are in gray are not, and they're not responding at all. And this is revealing we have single cell control over individual cells by guiding light in the brain of a living animal, not in a dish anymore, but a, a living uh, mouse. And we then take this and we move to the uh, 
free moving behavior situation, we can do this. We've created fiber optic uh, devices coupled to laser diodes that let us get light directly into uh, the brain of animals, including rats, mice, and uh, non-human primates. And here's an example, uh, what you heard in the introduction, this was uh, our, the first indication we had in 2007 that this technology actually might work. Uh, we can play this uh, video and you'll see a little spot of blue light appear above the animal's uh, head. Uh, and that's when we start putting in the laser light. And what you'll see, this light is in the right side of its brain, its motor cortex. When the blue light comes on, you'll see the animal start to turn left as it's doing now. And so this animal didn't want to turn left before, now it seems to really want to. And after one more rotation, we'll turn off the light and you'll see the animal will stop. And it just looks up at us, uh, doesn't seem distressed. It just uh, went from wanting to turn left to not wanting to turn left. And this was the first moment, although we already knew that part of the brain uh, uh, achieved this uh, function, there was not a scientific insight at that moment, but it was more a technological insight that we now could do this. We could instantaneously uh, change what an organism was going to do uh, with a very specific uh, optical intervention. And now this may be a little uh, exciting. It also might be a little disturbing to see that, to see uh, what an animal wants to do so specifically and instantaneously uh, controlled. And this is a very important uh, discussion to have going forward. But the basic science has been incredibly exciting. We've been able to study things from anxiety to parenting, as I'll show you in this uh, slide. First on the left, uh, we were able to use optogenetics uh, to deconstruct the state of anxiety. Now, anxiety is probably the leading uh, cause of morbidity uh, in psychiatry. It's the most common psychiatric diseases are the anxiety disorders as a group. And yet our treatments are not that good uh, for psychiatric uh, uh, diseases that are based on anxiety. We don't have as deep an understanding as we'd like. Now, what is anxiety? It's a complex state. There's a lot going on with anxiety. There are physiological changes. The heart beats faster. The respirations come more quickly. So there are bodily changes. There are also behavioral changes. We avoid risky situations. There are also our internal subjective states. Anxiety feels bad and the resolution of anxiety uh, feels good. So it's got many features and they're all wrapped up together to define a state. What we found using optogenetics is how those different features are assembled by projections across the brain. There is one projection from a brain structure called the BNST that goes to the ventral tegmental area, the dopamine neurons that Professor DeZeo talked about. And that controls the internal subjective state, the negativity of anxiety or the positivity from its release. Another projection goes to a structure called the lateral hypothalamus and that governs the behavioral changes of anxiety. Another projection goes to the parabrachial nucleus deep in the brainstem, and that controls the respiratory changes. And a master region uh, sends out projections to all these different regions and creates and assembles the state of anxiety. This turns out to be a general principle. We can understand how complex brain states are created and assembled from their parts. My colleague, uh, Catherine Duloc, in 2018, Deconstructed parenting, if you can believe that, a quintessential mammalian state of, of caring uh, for young and using the same set of principles that we discovered, she found uh, one projection uh, in the brain uh, from the MPOA to the PAG uh, that controls uh, going out and collecting the young that have strayed from the nest and bringing them back in. Uh, I have uh, four little kids who, who are I'm constantly having to collect them and, and any uh, parent or sibling knows how much uh, just going out and getting the kids and bringing them back is a big part of parenting. Well, it turns out there's a projection uh, from one part of the brain to another that if you turn that up or down, you can turn up or down that propensity to go out and, and collect the young. But it doesn't affect other aspects of parenting. It doesn't affect the grooming, which we all know is another big part uh, of, of parenting as well, uh, the, the, the physical care. It turns out a different projection uh, to a different part of the brain MPOA to the, to the VTA helps uh, uh, govern aspects of that. And so we have different projections to different parts of the brain that, that together create the, the state of parenting. And is, there are many other examples of this, but these reflect the, the promise and the opportunity of understanding our, the complexities of our inner states, how they work well and, and how they can go wrong. And for me, it's uh, a, a testament to the importance of basic science 
that all this understanding has its deepest roots in the botanist, you know, more than 150 years ago, just exploring uh, how some algae uh, moved in response to light. And to me, that is emblematic of where we've uh, come from and uh, the path forward that uh, will guide us, uh, uh, basic science and the delight of uh, understanding. I'm very grateful to all my students, colleagues, collaborators around the world, to everybody at Erasmus University. Uh, I'm tremendously honored and grateful, and I look forward uh, to seeing you all soon uh, in the future of our healing world. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Carl Dice Roth. Um, that was genuinely inspiring. Um, congratulations again, and thank you for everything you do. The world is better off because of people like you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.